So today we're going to do button versus big blind, which is what I would consider the most complex part of most Hold'em games. And the reason it's the most complex is because you're dealing with the widest ranges. The button, you're opening as many hands as you will from any other position. And the big blind is defending a ton of hands as well, and especially against the button. So when you've got these really wide ranges, you've got both players playing a ton of really crappy cards, which leads to a lot of difficult situations. So we're going to talk about navigating a lot of those and explain to you the hypothetical I've uh, drawn up here. This is a simulated game between two of my students. They're both 5'10 pros. They're both really good players. They've got one of them has a million in live earnings and the other one has two million. One's a WPT champion. Point being, very good players. Um, they're pretty comparable in skill level. There's really not one player I'd pick over the other. And what they're doing here is they're playing on PokerStars.net. They're playing, you can see it says play money table in the middle. And this is an exercise I set up for them where they're playing 100 big blinds deep. And it's a hypothetical situation where they're day two of a $3,500 WPT. And the small blind is a break-even player. And the reason that matters is because it's going to affect their opening range. I also told them it's an average difficulty table. Um, all of this is going to factor in in small little ways to ranges and maybe some of the decisions we make post-flop. For instance, if you have an incredibly soft table, you might want to protect your tournament life a little bit more. And if you have a really, really difficult table that's not going to break on that day, you can take some more marginal spots. Um, all that said, it's not a huge factor uh, when we're talking about most of these hands, but it's worth knowing all the info they had going in. So we're going to see this only from Brisket's house, uh, his perspective, and we're just going to critique his side for now. I'll play the video. I'm going to have some notes pop up as we go along, and I'm going to pause it at various points to talk about what we do. So pretty simple defend here, um, a 3x on the button, and I think that's pretty good reg into reg. Once you get down maybe around 30 big blinds, you're not going to be 3xing the button. Maybe a 2.5x looks good. And pause it here for this note. So there's a 50% C bet from the button. And I just said that we're at a severe range disadvantage, again, from Brisket's house perspective. And we have very low or 0% check raise on this flop. So a lot of people might see this and say, we got a pair and a flush draw, really good hand. Um, and we can be a little deceptive and check raise it. And I would say on ace, king, eight, you're at such a big range disadvantage, meaning your opponent has such an advantage as far as the strongest hands go, pocket aces, pocket kings, ace, king, that it's really, really difficult for us to be check raising this board. We're giving away a lot by doing it. Pocket eights is one of our hands that might want to check raise for value here. But the problem is that's really the only monster hand we have on this flop. So I would pretty much advocate a pure check call strategy, check call and check fold, if you are uh, in this situation on this flop. And check raising, you could insert some as an exploit, but you would really want to know what you're doing. And again, the board doesn't change much on that offsuit five. It's what I would call a neutral card. Doesn't really benefit either player's range. So we're just going to check. And the river is fantastic. Offsuit three, and we'll pause it here to talk about our spot. So I said we nearly always have the best hand. That's true. The opponent checked the turn. The only hands we see beating us are that really rare pocket threes or ace three that took a conservative check on the turn, that's very, very rare. We're very high up in our value range. Um, the reason being, like I said, we don't have pocket aces, we don't have pocket kings, we don't have ace king. So as far as top hands that we have, two pair or better, yeah, we can have ace eight, ace five, ace three, but king three is really high when you compare that to all of the king X that we would consider value betting here, all of the ace x, and I would even advocate for a tiny bet with an 8x against most good opponents. 
Um, and that's what I said here. We're value betting an 8x plus, and the opponent is almost never raising our bet on this river. And the reason is, after he checks the turn, this river improves him to a raising hand almost never. He needs that rare pocket threes, um, which I would probably barrel on the turn for what it's worth, or like a 2-4 suited, which a good player shouldn't be opening on the button into another good player. So I don't think we're getting raised here. So I, the reason that's relevant is I don't like trying to induce a raise. I don't think betting 350 or something, you know, in the third pot to 40% pot range is going to get a good opponent to spaz here. So we really need to create the value ourselves by making a big bet. And since we're very high up in our value range, I really like an over bet here. I'll see what he went for. He's clicking it up, clicking it up. Yeah, one more. 1,400 into 1,100. And I like this bet a lot. Um, do I think we're getting called very often? No. I think the opponent has no showdown value very, very often. And that's fine. But of the times that they do have something, let's pause here and take a look at this for a minute. I think that this is a really good bet because we have a lot of potential bluffs. We have... Every jack-10, every queen-10, every queen-jack, they're all going to want a bluff. And then every time we have diamonds that didn't find a pair, there's a lot of those. Some 7-9 of diamonds, 6-4 of diamonds. I mean, th there's a lot of combinations that need to bluff here. They don't all need to overbet, but some of them are going to want to make that bet because sometimes you will have pocket-8s, ace-5, ace king-3, hands like this. Move on to the next one. Um, actually, you know, I'm going to take a look and see this question section. See if anyone's hitting me with some questions. Is that it? Hello, hello. Yes, yes. Great. Hi, Mr. Little. I see. He is here, but hi, Mr. Jaffe. Jonathan and I actually played a final table together. My first significant final table, probably his like eighth significant final table. But um, when we played heads up, it was really long. And the poor announcer, he was dying with Jonathan raises, Jonathan calls, Jonathan raises, Jonathan calls. And uh, yeah, I think it eventually turned a little in Jaffe. Side note tangent. All right, I'm um, looking through the questions. I want to see if I can clear these so that I can catch new ones. Hmm. Sorry for the delay, guys. Yeah, I'm going to struggle with that, but I will check in again and hopefully I'll see some. All right. Let's play it. Pretty nice hand on the button. And you see, 300. Uh, both players are going to stick to this size the whole game. I don't think 250 or 275 is an awful size here, but I would not be 2xing the button with a reg in the big blind. You're just giving them too good of a price. Um, all that dead money with those antes, I want to charge them. So I'm talking about the C-bet here with our note. I said, we're folding very few better hands with a C-bet, and this hand proceeds very poorly, and we're occasionally winning at showdown. Those are all points advocating for a check back. The first being very straightforward. If we're not folding better hands on the flop, that takes away one of the great benefits of a C-bet. Now, it's not entirely true because pocket twos through pocket sixes, I would say, are usually going to fold this flop. And that's something, but there's not too many combinations of those. Then I said it proceeds very poorly. Yeah, there's no turn that we're excited about. I mean, Ace of Diamonds is a great turn, but it's not some hand where we're going to start hammering turn river very confidently. Uh, we might go two more streets, but we're going to be really hopeful that we dodge about mm, 24 different rivers, um, even if we get that prime turn. So this just isn't proceeding very well. And we are occasionally winning at showdown. Sometimes our opponent just has some no equity hand that's not going to ever stab. They just have four or five of hearts, and um, they're not going to touch an offsuit 10 turn. And he does check, which I like. King of hearts is an interesting turn. We've got two flush draws. The board is very wet. But by checking the flop, we have capped our range. We never have a set on that flop. We never have a straight. We should never, and we should never have two pair either. Strongest hands we have after that turn or after the flop, mostly queen jack, jack 10, that kind of thing. And this is a pretty straightforward call. 
And we talk about that turn really quickly. It's easy. We beat a lot of hands. He can have plenty of flush draws, plenty of straight draws. There's no reason to raise here um, when we've taken all of those awesome hands, like two pair plus out of the equation. Um, if we raise there just to try and check back a river, a good opponent is going to exploit the shit out of us. Um, they're going to come back over the top with their whole range, and they, they should. The river, of course, makes 10 to a straight, and this is a river where we're going to fold to a bet. We'll get bluffed sometimes by some flush draws, but we'll let it go. And he checks. And if I range him here really quickly, I'd say it's a lot of two pairs, an occasional bluff giving up, um, and a lot of queen X. And this time it's a two pair. We'll let him take it. Not worthy of a bluff. I'm going to pause for a minute, take a quick look at some of these questions. On Ace King, I'm always told by my fellow peers that I should 3x the bet preflop. Um, yeah, I'm good with that. If you're talking about three betting, that's a decent size. Um, you can even go larger. And a lot of it is balance. If, if you're feeling confused preflop, just do the same thing with everything until you get more comfortable. Um, one of the issues I run into a lot um, playing against less experienced or less confident opponents is that there's a lot I can read into their sizing. There's a lot of narrative going on where they go certain sizes with good hands, with bad hands, and reading into their lack of balance can give me a big edge. So if you're not feeling confident with your sizing preflop, I would say large and the same. Um, just keep doing the same size with each thing. As you get more confident, ace-king is the kind of hand where I want to go a larger size. Uh, I don't get why it's heads up. Shouldn't there be a button small and big? Yeah, so we don't have a prop player for this situation. So we're just simulating it. We're pretending that there is a small blind. Um, additionally, one thing I didn't mention, they are pretending as if there's an ante. Unfortunately, PokerStars.net does not have the uh, ante option in the home game feature. But I'm telling them to play their ranges as if there were an ante in play. But we're going to play post-flop with the pot the size that it is. I hope that makes sense. How do you feel about trapping? Um, in general, I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, I have some terrible off-color jokes, so I'm going to hold back. All right. Um, the button opened. We defended 5-2 suited here. Very quickly, very, very close. Razor thin. I like defending 5-3 suited in better for a 3x. Um, this is just a little bit too light. I would fold. Unless you feel an edge on your opponent. But we're acting as if both opponents are equal. And we've got a little C-bet here. And let's see. Whoa. I already went through it. I'm supposed to pause. Okay. Um, really quick. Let me make sure. Can you guys all see that exploit in the top right? Oh, wait. It's not fully developed. Okay. Um, first, just talk about it from a straightforward perspective. I said, this is not a good check raise or float candidate. If you look at it, you can see some back doors. And you say, hey, I can't check call with this hand. But a lot of times when someone makes a light defend or a light flat, they feel compelled to get creative with it. And that can lead to hemorrhaging off equity. And this is one of those spots where I can definitely see a 2011 version of myself starting to go crazy. Um, to be honest, it might have been good in 2011. But you see this. It's a pretty small bet. Opponent is betting 38% pot maybe. We don't have any showdown value. We are out of position. We're two cards away from a value hand. The majority of turn cards leave us drawing dead. This is just crap. You can't start manufacturing on a board like this. Yeah, is your opponent going to fold some weak holdings? Sure. Pocket fours, in the muck. Eight, seven suited, he's folding. But you're going to have such better candidates to bluff here. And my little exploit note is that Versus nits, you could check raise small with hands like 5-4 suited, 5-6 suited, 6-7 suited. Um, a quick note about how I like to do things. If I have an S after something like 5-4, it just means suited generic. If I put DD, uh, it's going to mean 5-4 of diamonds. So when I say 5-4 suited in this case, I'm talking about the ones with a backdoor flush draw. 
adding up those little bits of equity, having five, four clubs, diamonds or hearts here, you're going to find some straights here and there, some flushes. So versus a really nitty opponent who you think might bet fold a nine or um, just kind of aimlessly see bets uh, without really a clue what they're doing, hands like ace, queen, ace, 10, pocket eights, um, you can slide in an extra raise here. But I would consider that exploitative, and I wouldn't do that against a peer that I respect. I'll pause for one more second, take a look at some questions. Let's see what we got. We got nothing. Unless, yeah, okay. Let's go ahead. Nine, eight off is right on the border here. Um, I'm good with this open with that break even player in the middle. If there was two peers, small blind and big blind, really close. So dream flop. And as much as we want to pour chips in on this flop, King 8-8 eight, eight rainbow just doesn't really demand any big C-bets. Um, you could make your small C-bet 15% and your big maybe up to 25%, but there's just so few hands that are going to want to bet 50%, 60%, 75%, you know, just doesn't really work that way. So sometimes you have a hand like this that wants to bet big, but it doesn't make enough sense with all the crap hands you're going to have on the button. Excuse me. <clears throat> all right turn is a nine make a full house talking about sizing here the nice thing about this nine is it creates a lot of opportunities for some of our bluffs one it opens up some straight draws we can have 10 7 suited jack 10 7 6 we can have two hearts we can have queen jack queen 10 so it's really really nice that it was such a connected turn. Um, on an offsuit too, we wouldn't be able to bet big because there still wouldn't be much in the way of bluffs we could have that could river something. Um, so I like, and this is a great spot to bet big because we're very high up in our value range and we still have plenty of bluffs. But big is still relative and big here, he goes three quarters. I love that. And he gets a fold, unfortunate. Uh, we got a question here. Is your theory applicable in a cash game only? How about heads up tournament play? Um, this is for both right now. This is actually a simulation of button versus big blind in a tournament. That's how they're playing it. So their ranges actually aren't, don't reflect how they would play in cash game, which is a tighter opening range and a tighter defend range. The reason being no antis. And this is a little run of hands that we're just going to get through. There's nothing going on. All right. A60, pretty standard defend. And this is a spot where I think a lot of people are interested what to do against a C-bet. So we'll see what size Oitari comes up with. And it's 2 into 567. And I've put a little exploit up. The exploit I wrote is that we could fold here versus an opponent with a reduced C-bet percentage and or a tighter than average button opening percentage. So that's longhand for a nit. Um, if you think your opponent is pretty nitty, but reasonably capable, I would fold here. And the reason is nits tend to check back some of their borderline hands like king 10, king jack, and maybe they're opening a little bit less with hands like eight, nine off. Um, they are basically never having a six, five, oh, maybe they don't have a six, four suited, five, eight suited, stuff like that. And that's going to make when they don't have those weak hands, calling here is going to be less profitable for us. We're going to be going up against a stronger range. So versus that kind of player, I'm good with a fold. But versus a reg that you respect, it's very uncomfortable, but you have to make this call. It's only 200 into 567. And even though we've turned some equity here, I just like checking. We're not really folding him off a better hand. Maybe some brick three, but 
there's really not much sense in leading this hand because we're still good. The opponent still has plenty of hands that we beat a bunch of the time. It's not like he's checking back 9-10 suited, 8-9-0. Um, and we river a 6, but it's a one-liner. A 4 now makes a straight, and this is an interesting spot. Let's see what he opts to do. That's 290 into 945. So my question is, if you're going to make a value bet, you have to have bluffs. What are our bluffs in this spot? And a lot of players are going to really struggle to come up with bluffs. And the reason is they don't float the flop appropriately. They're folding hands like King Jack, King 10, especially Jack 10 suited, 10 9 suited. And when I say suited here, I'm talking about the ones with the backdoor flush draw. And if you're making those folds, then this value bet makes no sense because you're really out of bluffs. The lowest you could be in your range is going to be like that ace eight through ace jack. Um, and then you can't make a value bet like this. But if you're floating appropriately, if you're calling this flop bet with king jack and with jack 10 suited, even 10 nine suited, then you can make this bluff or this value bet because you will have bluffs in your range. Um and these players both respect each other, so Oitari is going to know that. And if he's sitting with a hand like King Five of Diamonds, he's going to have a real decision with this really, really good price that Brisket's House is laying him. Um, and I like this bet a lot. I think it's really, really borderline whether to bet or check here. So close that I would check a five, but I would bet probably all my sixes in this situation. And he's betting really, really small. When we talk about thin value bets, you want to be really, really low on the sizing. Give yourself the best chance to be called. This is a pretty boring hand, so we're going to go through it really quick. He just defends King 10-0. Ace 4-4. Four, four. We're going to check call a tiny bet if it comes in, but it doesn't. This player checks back. We turn a gutter. This is where it gets close. Um, versus nits and versus players that you expect to be very low check back percentage with an ace on this flop, which I would caution people to not overestimate their ability to deduce whether their opponent is that type of player or not. You're going to want a lot of information to know that. Um, but that being said, if you do feel pretty confident that this player doesn't check back an ace almost ever, then this is a pretty good turn to barrel. Your opponent's probably working with a lot of hands like pocket fives through pocket kings, um, a hand just like yours. Um, Let's go ahead and try and two barrel them off of that. We do have four outs to what's essentially the nuts in this situation. But he opts to check, and I think that's reasonable. We still have the winner on occasion here. And he checks the offsuit eight turn. After checking the or river. After checking the turn, I think this is close. If you do want to bluff it, maybe 400. The issue is we don't have many aces in our range that check the turn. So. I don't know. I mean, I think we, we end up winning this pot versus a lot of players 5 to 10% of the time, and that's worth something. That kind of keeps us off some bluffs. So he had King Queen O there, which I like Oitari's line a lot there for what it's worth. All right. We have a lot of questions. I'm going to pause it, take a look at them. Um, first, can some people type in whether or not they can hear? Um, I see one comment that says they can't hear. One comment says, why is only one headphone working with this? Probably because I'm terrible with computers. I need to figure that out because I think one or two of the videos that I've made already has that same issue. So um, I got to figure out how microphones work, how technology. I wonder if there's... Geek Squad for this. All right, I'm going to back up. We got a lot of questions. Would you ever bet huge on that King 8 8 board? If so, why? No, I would not. Um, I have hands that want to bet huge, um, like that 9 8, but we have to restrain ourselves because you have so many no equity and very weak equity hands. Take a 6 7 suited, um, Queen 10 of diamonds that need to be winning that pot, um, and they can't afford to be putting out so much money with such little equity. Um, okay, is that, da, da, I think 350 would be a better bet, maybe. Um, uh, move, move, move. 
Are you going as low as 15%? This is on that King 8 8 board. Are we betting as low as 15% strictly on paired boards after the button opens, big blind defend? Or do we like that on most dry boards in general? Um, great question. Tough for me to give a specific answer. All I would say is it's not only paired boards. 15% is a size that can apply to super dry boards in general. Um, again, it's also going to depend where we open. But yeah, button versus big blind, like an ace 2-7, I think it's really reasonable to have a 15% C-bet. And let's see. When you say a tighter opening range, what is the bottom of the opening range from the button heads up? Great question. Um, so in this situation, I want both of these guys who I think should respect each other equally to be opening around King 7-0 on the button. They could maybe bring it down to like King 6, possibly King 5, uh, if, because the small blind is hypothetically a break-even player where these are guys that I expect to be in the 60 ROI range uh, in WPTs. But um other hands let's say bottom suited connector i like them opening four five suited bottom pair twos ace three off plus um, maybe in this situation ace two off plus um let's see off suit hands jack eight oh um that's what we're looking at what stack depth are we assuming for these examples except uh exactly the stack depth that's in front of them they started off at 100 um it varies slightly but yeah 100 um that's a longer question making you feel stupid sorry not my intention uh we can work on that hopefully so tilting only one headphone yep i suck at computers sorry guys um what is our large bet size going to be on this river two-thirds pot with some forex um that was the nine eight i think um sorry i'm lost i'm not exactly sure where that was I'm going a little too quick Okay, people can hear, good. All right, we're gonna move along. Thank you guys for the questions. I'll learn how to do this a little better. All right, so you open 980, flop is jack 76. This is definitely gonna be a C bet. Um, the criteria I think about when I'm C betting is, what kind of benefits does it have? One, do I fold better hands? That's great, that's immediate benefit. Two, am I building the pot for when I win it eventually if i have a really strong draw or if i have a made hand already those are the kinds of things we want to think about when c betting if you have a hand like ace queen of diamonds that doesn't benefit nearly as much because it's not folding better hands on this flop really and it doesn't proceed terribly well either 980 has the opposite of both of those so he went pretty big here take a quick look 390 into 567 and this is a board texture that you can bet big you don't have to bet this big but this hand is a pretty good um pretty good candidate to bet large here we're going to get a few extra folds hands like ace five of clubs might not handle this bet so well but they would if you bet 200 there's a lot of things that fall in there turn is a seven and that's an interesting turn because it's pretty bad for our range the reason is not just because we bet the flop. It's not like by betting the flop, we can't have a seven, but he bet large on the flop. 390 doesn't make too much sense into 567 when you're holding a hand like 57, ace seven. Um, you want draws like we're like we have here, the nine eight, and you want big hands like pocket sixes or ace jack, um, pocket kings. Those are really nice, particularly without a spade. So I said this is a bad turn card for our range, but we still have value hands that need to bet. A lot of people shy away from this turn because they say, oh, I can't have a seven. This is this is too predictable. But here's what you do have going for you. You still could have that ace seven, king seven. I don't like that so much. It's possible, though. But seven, six suited makes plenty of sense. Um, there's only one combination, so it's not too relevant. And then there's three combinations of pocket sixes, three combinations of pocket jacks. You would want to continue betting big with those. Also, something to keep in mind is both players know that the seven is good for Oitari's range. So he's going to lead a lot on that seven. When he doesn't, the amount of sevens he has diminishes. It's not like he's leading all of his sevens all the time. Some players might. But since good players understand when the board changes to their favor and they'll start leading, hopefully balanced when they have it and when they don't, um, his check indicates he's probably very low on sevens. So if I'm Brisket's house in this situation, and I have one of my really high-end value hands that um, beats most jacks but loses to trip sevens, take pocket queens, ace jack, king jack, 
I'm going to keep hammering away. After he checked, I'm not too concerned about the seven. So because of that, I would keep betting with your bluffs that most want to bet. And nine, eight falls into that category. We're not winning with nine high. We do have some outs and we have outs to hands that we can value bet on the river. We're not going to value bet um, a nine or an eight river, but a five or a 10, maybe even a five or 10 of spades. I would still consider betting. Um, I actually would. Let's see what he goes for. And he checks back. I think a lot of players would do that there. River is an offsuit three. Gets kind of uninteresting here. Because Oitari puts out a small bet. And we're just going to fold with nine high. There's no sense in turning this into a bluff. Moving along. All right, Queen 8 0. This is pretty borderline, but we would defend this. And that's a good flop for our range. Um, talking about that real quickly, I dissected that Ace King 8 and explained why that's a bad flop for our range. But when you talk about button versus big blind, one thing that makes it super complicated is they're dealing with incredibly wide ranges, but also incredibly similar ranges. Major differences between a button and big blind range is that the big blind is really devoid of the top end hands. They don't have aces, kings, queens, jacks. Um, they shouldn't have tens. Oftentimes they don't have nines. Those are three betting preflops. So by defending, you've signaled you don't have those. Uh, ace, king, ace, queen, also mandatory three bets. Um, ace, jack suited, most players are three betting that. King, queen suited, some players are three betting that. So those hands can be taken out or partially taken out of the big blinds range. And that's going to dictate a lot of those big boards and how we play Broadway boards, like an ace queen nine, something like that. Um, but a, a flop like six, five, two, where both players can have all the sets. Um, Oitari maybe doesn't have three, four suited, but he's got seven, eight suited, um, maybe an eight, nine, oh, they're working with a lot of the same hands. Um, so where if the opener was from under the gun, the big blind would have a pretty good range advantage, but button versus big blind, I would say the big blind only has a slight range advantage here. And that comes down to the three, four and defending a few more suited hands than the buttons opening. But again, it might be a good board for us, but this is a crap hand for that board. If we had a little slice of equity, a four, a three, a nine, seven, um, we could stab. Now we get to the river though, and we face two checks and that's a lot of weakness. And when we see a lot of weakness and we have a hand that's not going to win, that calls for a bluff a lot of the time. First note is we're very low in our range. I said we're under 3% to win with a check. It's tough to imagine what checks three times that we beat. Um, maybe a very timid uh, Jack-9 suited. There's just not much. I said we have plenty of value hands of varying strength in our range, and our opponent is very capped. They usually have a 5x or worse in this situation. A lot of ace high, um, then some hands like ace-2, um, queen-5 suited, ace 5 -0, oh, stuff like that. Um, and they have, because of that, they have no easy calls if we decide to bet the river. The only easy calls for less than a pot size bet would be like a 10 X. Um, and I said that because if we bet 650, the opponent knows 10 X is still just a bluff catcher. Um, we're probably the only player that can have a flush. It seems very unlikely that Oitari has checked back a flush draw twice. I would say a very, very rare, like six, seven of diamonds. I might find a double check, but pretty much we're the only guy with a flush which means we can also smash this river a bunch of the time. Now, wouldn't most of our flush draws bet the turn? Yeah, a good percentage of them. But I would say the ones with a six in them and maybe some of the ace highs that feel confident um, might have checked the turn. And then the other thing is, because our opponent doesn't have a flush and doesn't have a straight, we can smash two pairs on the river. Um, we don't even think they made a set. There's no way they're checking back pocket tens on the flop, especially since they wouldn't have the ten of diamonds. So I like bluffing here for sure. A question of what size. We're really going to vary with size here. That's one of the most difficult things in poker is deciding what size with our bluffs. Um, all right, I put up another exploit here. I said rip one and a half to two and a half times the pot versus opponents who struggle to make hero calls. Um, I'm going to advocate for this a lot. If you look at 
the top players in poker. And then you look at some guys who make money, our winners, our pros, well-known. One of the biggest differences is the top end players find what I call extra bluffs. Sometimes it's a matter of bluffing where the other player wouldn't. And sometimes it's a matter of pumping up the size. Um, just kind of using your cojones and just going for it. And yeah, it's going to suck every once in a while. You're going to bet two and a half times the pot. This guy's going to call you with pocket fours. Uh, and he's going to be explaining to the table and to you while he scoops in your chips, how you just wouldn't have bet that large if you had a value hand and he's going to be a genius for a moment, but you need to live with that. That's going to happen. Getting great at poker means dealing with that, um, dealing with those situations that at first are awkward. Um, so I would just smash this river against a lot of opponents. Um, I don't even need to have a diamond blocker or anything. It's not relevant. I might just have a, um, Jack nine of clubs, a hand that just never had a chance to stab. I see this river and I say, no, guy's not going to call bet 1200. And he grabs a fold. Unfortunately, this one doesn't see a flop. Is there a call? This one does. Ace 10 0. Uh, I wouldn't three bet this. Uh, that's getting a little bit light. I like just calling this. You can three bet Ace 10 suited against an opponent who opens a lot on the button, but you're starting some difficult spots for yourself. I like defending that too. I'm going to pause for a second and take a look at questions. Before I lose track, sound is good for me. Can hear fine. See me. All right, people are saying headphones work great. That's nice. Cool. What makes you bet six and check five on the river? Um, it's really just that close. Uh, relating number of combos. Right? This was at the a six on that queen seven three six five. Um, yeah, it's really, really close. I think if we have a five, we worry about our opponent having river to six some. It's a difference maker. It's just in poker, we're going to come across a lot of situations. Uh, Range-wise, it'd be like, why do you open king 4-0 here, but you don't open king 3-0? Because you got to draw the line somewhere. The razor thin. Let's see. On the king 10 hand, you talk about barreling the turn. Would you fire on a missed river on that spot? Absolutely. We're not just betting this was ace 4-4 four, four rainbow, and I talked about potentially betting an offsuit jack turn. Um, yeah, we're not just betting to build for when we hit a queen and to snag folds on the turn. It's going to be a two-barrel. That's a great question. Um, we do not want to bet that turn just to give up. Okay. <laughs> Somebody said, sorry for complaining. You got to laugh out of me. That was good. I don't know what the complaint was, but I love it. I like anyone who apologizes for anything because nobody apologizes because I don't know. In the age of the internet and Instagram and Twitter, everyone's an asshole. Not you guys. You guys are great. Easy check call. I like that. Waiting, waiting. Okay, let's talk about this. 780 into 1134, um, I guess around 70% pot. And we have a hand that we know is good very often, but we know is going to be comfortable on the river almost never. And the idea is, even if we hit an ace, um, King Jack has now made a better hand. Uh, he could already have a hand that is impenetrable. He could have pocket twos, pocket queens. Um, and... We're just never going to feel really, really comfortable except on an offsuit 10 river. Um, and I guess the only 10s are offsuit because we have the 10 of hearts. That being said, you still have to make this call. It's going to be a lot of check call and then very tough decision on the river, depending on the river. Um, some of them are going to be easy folds that suck, and some of them are going to be difficult decisions. But you just can't fold this high up in your range at this point. The opponent overbets here. This might be a hand that could find a fold. But remember, opponent just has so many potential bluffs. Hearts, King Jack, Jack 9. He can stretch to Jack 8, 8, 9, 8, 7. And the river is really good for us. It's an offsuit 6, which I would consider a neutral card because he doesn't have many 6s that bet this flop and bet the turn. I mean, Queen 6 suited, which is getting really rare here. Um, 
other than that, there's not much the six impacts. Now we don't have many sixes either. We would have to have had a pair on the flop to have a six in our hand. So we have 10, six, maybe two, six suited, um, maybe queen six. But the idea is it's a difficult card for a lot of his bluffs. It's going to be a tough spot. We still have a tough decision, but I'm going to call against capable opponents fold to a lot of the population because they struggle to bluff here. And he checks back. We take it. Take a quick look at the questions here. Um, <laughs> I might be an asshole. You don't know. I love it. Um, all right. Thank you. Nice compliment. Um, if villain plays top 15% range, what would you not think he has a queen on the flop? Hmm. I'm a little confused. I don't think we've got either guy playing just 15%. Uh, I'm probably misunderstanding the question. Sorry about that. That's the reason I left all the poker message boards. It came here because they're all assholes. Love it, Christine. I'm sure you are right. That's the reason I've never looked at poker message boards because people love to troll and they don't really know whether they're trolling or just going through their own form of anger management. There's my riff. So we got a pretty good hand here. Middle pair, some backdoor straight draw, backdoor flush draw. Um, no doubt going to check call. Again, don't get creative. All that backdoor nonsense I just mentioned, it's not a mandate to check raise. There's nothing going on there. Why did this freeze? I know this guy, C-Bet. Very strange. Okay, he disconnected. Yeah, so he C-Bet's 300 into 567, and we're definitely going to check call. This is another one of those boards where the opponent has a really good range advantage. They're the only person who should have ace queen, pocket queens, pocket aces. So even if you do have a hand that looks like a nice check raise, nine, ten of diamonds, you need to pass on it. This is going to be pretty exploitative. Um, they know you don't have really good value very much. Your only options would be queen eight, ace eight, and pocket eights, and none of them are the top, top. Um, so it's a scary way to play 100 big blinds out of position and just go for broke with a lot of those hands. So I'm check calling and check folding on this flop person opponent I respect. Easy check on the turn. Again, we get that offsuit five neutral card. I think that's the same that we had on the ace king eight. And we've got a bet coming in and the Jaffe comment box. So they bet 780. Again, that's like a 70% pop bet. And we said opponent range includes superior made hands and draws. That is to say that if they have a pair, it's mostly better than ours. They're not betting with some queen six here. That doesn't make any sense. Um, this bet's not coming in from 10-8. The only made hands that we beat that I see a bet coming in from are like twos through fours as a nice bluff. And then some hands that have diamonds, like king five of diamonds. Um, that's really it. Basically, they have a draw or they have a made hand that beats us. So we very often have the best hand. We're beating 6, 7, 9, 10, Jack 9, Jack 10, King 10, King Jack, Brick Diamonds. But our offsuit 9 blocks some of those hands I just mentioned. Um, 10, 9, Jack 9, and then 9, 7 of hearts, 9, 6 of hearts, because um, we have the heart. And our improvement cards are very worrisome, and none of them are check raise candidates. So if we river in nine, cool. We're definitely happy with that, um, especially if it's an offsuit nine. But it's not going to be strong enough to check raise. Same thing with a queen. If the river is a queen of spades, fantastic. We're not leaving. But it's not strong enough to check raise. You might lead, but um, I just it's nothing is ever going to get exceptional here. And we worry when we hit a nine that we make him a straight sometimes. Um, when the river's a nine, one, it could be a diamond and give him a flush. And two, it could give him the jack 10 straight or the six, seven suited straight. So that makes our hand one of the strongest hands that I would advocate check folding here. We are probably folding the best hand more often than not here, but this is going to be a really shit bluff catcher on the river. Um, even on an offsuit two river, I just don't want to call with this hand because that nine still blocks a few of his bluffs. So the difference maker is... If I had queen two, so let's say queen two of spades, I'll check call that. 
because the two doesn't block any of his bluffs. I don't expect him to have three, two or four, two. And that's just close enough where against opponent I respect, I can't let him slide by with all those bluffs we mentioned. I'm going to make a light call with that hand, but having that nine, it just makes him value heavy by like two or 3% more. And that's enough to tip the scales into a fold. And let's see if he makes the fold. Finds the call. And I think this is a call that a lot of players, good players, amateurs alike, are making. It feels really weak to fold this turn. I think that's very common. And if there's one hand that I think is most important that we review today, it's that exact decision, that turn decision. Um, it's not weak to fold there. It is a little weak to fold like a queen to a spades, but understanding when you block your opponent's bluffs, making a fold, very, very important. And we get to the river here. And we don't get tested. He ends up winning. Check back, giving up bluff. And if I recall, that opponent had 10, seven of diamonds, and I do not like that give up. Um, the fact that he blocks six, seven, not relevant, but the fact that he gets some auto folds, Meaning, if you have 10-7 ten, ten, of diamonds and you bet that river, there's a few hands that your opponent can have that are basically never heroing if he thinks about it. Like if we have queen-10 of diamonds, king-10 of diamonds, 5x um, of diamonds, those are easy check calls on the turn that are easy folds on the river. Um, whenever you have a fair number of what I consider auto folds from your opponent, you need to bluff the river in some way. Um, so I don't like that check back. All right, here he defends king 8 and another really crappy flop for his range. Um, this is understanding range advantage, and, you know, we've seen a few of these flops now, ace-king-8, ace-queen-8, ace-queen-9, where, like I said, the button is just doing so much better. So in addition to being comfortable when you have a hand like, I don't know, ace-9, of course, you should also feel a lot more comfortable making bluffs with hands like pocket threes and just going three streets because you have so many big hands that want to value bet three streets and your opponent is so devoid of easy calls because he's very, very low on monster hands. Side tangent. Um, I'm going to pause again and take a quick look at questions. Don't all his ace high combos, ace combos outnumber his bluffs by far on ace eight, queen five. Thanks. Uh, good question. I don't know off the top of my head, um, ace X versus all the jack tens, jack nines, all that. But I would also say that not all of his ace combos are betting on the ace eight, queen five, where his bluff should be betting at a very, very high clip. Um, value hands that I would check on that ace eight, queen five. Um, I would find some checks with some of my aces that block equity. When I have ace with a 10 of diamonds, I might find a check on the turn a lot. Um, it doesn't bet call well if we get check raised, and it's way too much equity to bet fold. What sizing do you like on the river triple barrel where Oitari gave up with the queen nine on the queen nine? Um, yeah, I would say 10, seven of diamonds, a small bluff. Um, because when, when we're getting some of those auto folds, we don't need to bet much to get those ones. And then we can still get some, you know, hands like the exact one we had when somebody makes a bad call with a queen. Um, I think 50 or 60% pot is going to get it done when you're in position on the river. If you respect your opponent, it's very, very rare that I'm going to find a board where I want to value bet less than 50% value or bluff. Uh, less than 50% when I'm in position, because when you bet on the river in position, you're throwing the option back to your opponent. You're giving them a chance to check raise. Um, that shouldn't be taken lightly, even though it's an outlier, only maybe one to 5% of the time you're going to face a check raise. It's catastrophic. Um, the whole pot can shift. So you want to be careful. And because of that, I would not value or bluff less than 50% in position. Um, please get Jonathan to have some of your classes in the regular group. Um, thanks. Yeah, it's honestly, I signed on mostly to do the premium stuff. Um, I think there will be some webinars like this, but, um, I'm really tailoring the content to high end stuff. Um, so my apologies, but 
it's going to be in the premium section. If the button is raised first in, he doesn't always have a range advantage here. Um, I'm not sure what that means. He's still raising things like medium suited gappers and such, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if the question is on this flop, does the button always have a better hand? Absolutely no. Uh, and they are raising things like six, seven suited. The issue is having the top end stuff, pocket queens, pocket aces, more pocket nines, um, that is going to really hinder the big blind when you're talking about 100 big blinds deep. Who has more of the monsters is a big part of the range advantage. It's not just who do we think is averaging the better hand on the flop, which would still be the button. Okay, he checks here, super standard, and gets a check back. And I've got a note here. So it's an exploit. And just to clear things up, when I write exploit, what I mean by that is this is not a GTO play. This is something I'm advocating against a certain type of player. Sometimes it's the population. Sometimes there's things that I think that poker players in general um, screw up in balance. Um, they have a frequency imbalance, and we can take advantage of that. And sometimes we're taking advantage of nits. Sometimes we're taking advantage of lags. And I'm going to try and explain who we're going after when we are exploiting. Um, so my exploit here is consider leading a third to half pot versus opponents with a high CBET percentage. The idea here is we have a pretty crap hand. This isn't a hand that is excited to bluff because we never improve to a really good hand, and we rarely improve to a hand that could even consider value betting the river. It's, we need one of the three kings to even think about it. We have no straight draw, no flush draw. But if the opponent has a high CBET percentage, players like that are not going to be big candidates to have made a conservative check back here with an ace 10. Um, they are probably less saturated with king queen and queen 10 than most of the population. So they might have more of their no equity stuff, six, five suited, um, like six, five spades, um, pocket fives, stuff like that, that are going to be easy folds for us on the turn. And very importantly, the range advantage really uh, evaporates when he checks back the flop because he's signaling he doesn't have aces, doesn't have queens, doesn't have two pair at least on the flop, and that is going to give us, I wouldn't call it a mandate, but a lot more um, confidence betting a lot of our hands on the turn. So I would stretch to this hand, which the benefit of it is that we know the opponent is no longer sitting with some of his king X of hearts. Um, we're going to feel pretty confident. Also, they don't have king queen with the queen or with the king of hearts. So the relevance there is that on a heart river, I'm going to smash. Uh, I'm looking at like a 2x overbet on most heart rivers. And I think we're going to find some folds from him here on the turn. Um, this isn't to say that I'm betting every river. The other rivers that I like betting are like a 10 or a jack. Um, I think those complete a lot of our bluffs. But I would still give up on some rivers. Again, for a third pot or half pot bluff to work, uh, we don't need a very high success rate. But he checks and... Faces, half pot bet, and at this point, we're folding. And I don't blame him for this line at all. I think it's very reasonable and very normal. Uh, I want to take a quick look at questions. Um, let me know, guys, if I'm taking too many questions. This is my first time doing it. I don't know if uh, slowing it down too much for y'all. Couldn't the out of position call not three bet with big hands to even out the big blind range? Great question. Um, Jason's asking, can we mitigate that range advantage by just flatting ace queen pocket queens pocket aces absolutely you could absolutely do that the problem is you're sacrificing too much ev by doing it and this is a general train of thought that leads a lot of players to kind of a really really bad regression in their game they find that hey i'm in an uncomfortable situation i'm in a range disadvantage and they come up with this theory which is very relevant makes a lot of sense I'll just have some hands that I'm not supposed to have here, and this guy is going to screw himself by assuming I don't have them. The problem is you're losing so much equity not building these big pots and getting takedowns pre-occasionally by three-betting hands like queens and aces. Um, it's kind of like if you are a pitcher in baseball and you have a 3-0 count. Everyone's expecting a fastball somewhere near the middle, and 
just because it's predictable doesn't mean it's wrong. It's actually right because it's predictable. Cliches are cliches because they're true. Um, so if you throw a curveball on a 3-0 count, they're not going to see it coming very often. If you flat queens out of the big blind, um, it's going to be unexpected, but you're going so far out of bounds in the name of deception and trickery that you are hurting yourself long-term equity-wise. But a lot of players, um, some of the weaker pros and a lot of amateurs, they do these kinds of things because it's kind of a crutch for them post-flop. And there are times in my career that I've been guilty of this where it's pretty nice to just be playing post-flop with a lot of hands the opponent doesn't expect, and you can feel a lot smarter. But the problem is you're losing a lot of equity pre-flop. Um, great question. Let's see. Why wouldn't villain bet any ace he had? Uh, that was on that ace-queen-8-5. Some of them just don't work well as um, bet calls, like that ace-10 I mentioned, ace-7, ace-9. Um, and they're going to struggle to be three streets on a lot of rivers anyways. It's nice to have a couple of decent hands that you can file into your check back range and make them bluff catchers on the river. Good question, Matthew. Questions after each hand sounds good to Brian. Good. Christine says, how do you feel about checking back one of the four aces in order to protect your checking range? Um, if that means using one of the four aces as a randomizer, that sounds reasonable. Um, but a lot of what comes down to is what card is attached. Um, that's a little bit more of an in-depth discussion um, where I'd like to have a hand model in front to talk about it. But uh, sorry for the teaser. It would be a long conversation. Um, would you say the same for ace king? It was mandatory raise from the big blind earlier? Yeah. Ace King needs a three bet pre-flop. Um, the benefits of the deception of flatting Ace King pre, eh, not nearly strong enough. Um, it just doesn't overcome all the equity you're losing by not three betting. In the last hand, if you were the player on the button, if you're relying on your range advantage and three barreling things like pocket threes, why aren't you betting for three streets? Um, not sure what we mean, Dotan. I'm not sure which hands you're talking about not betting for three streets. Um, maybe you mean some of those middling aces, and that would be because we want some hands in the middle of our range to find checks. Um, they're going to make really good bluff catchers. Kind of a tough one for me to answer from here. Instead of flatting the premiums 100% in the big blind, couldn't you just do it 25% for balance? Great question, William. Um, yeah, there's going to be... So when you look at the lower end of your premiums, like a pocket nines, maybe pocket tens, ace-jack suited, king-queen suited, that's where you start playing a mixed strategy. Um, but if you respect your opponent, you just are sacrificing too much EV to flat kings 25% of the time here. If you watch the super high rollers, there's they can range each other as well as anyone. It's not just because they're great at poker. It's because they're playing very, very similar strategies. And it's actually really, really low deception. They know which bluffs the opponent is using and they know which value, but they get to the river and they say, okay, he has these 32 bluffs and these 64 value hands. And he just bet pot. Wow. This is like a break even decision. Um, it's not about showing up with things the opponent can't find. If I'm watching Jonathan Little play poker, he's watching me play poker, and we're playing in a 5-10 cash game, we should have a pretty good idea of the types of hands the opponent has. If, if neither of us, if we're guessing incorrectly about the range of hands the player's working with, that means either the observer or the player is doing some funky, bad stuff. The only exception there is if one of the players has a better idea of their opponents and they're adjusting to some exploits. But yeah, this is one of the most confusing, tricky things about poker is poker is so linked to deception that a lot of players, they, they get bogged down trying to be too deceptive. And I come from a heads up background, so I was very, very um, guilty of that. Someone says, I've been trapped by players who flat me with queens. Absolutely. Um, just like anything, the worst plays that you make in poker are still going to pay dividends from time to time. I've seen this. Um, I remember this year at the World Series in a six max, player opens the button. Um, small blind is this whale who's playing like outrageous. He's playing 80% of hands, raising all over the place, calling all over the place. And he just snap calls a small blind. And honestly, I think he has hands as light as eight, three suited in that situation. 
the big blind is a pro and he jams 25 big blinds with ace nine. And I thought that was very reasonable in that situation. A lot of free equity for the taking. Button folds, small blind snaps him with queens. Wow, it worked amazing. If he had three bet, the big blind was folding ace nine oh. Doesn't make it right. It was still a terrible flat. Uh oh, someone said audio went out. Uh, anyone else have that problem? Okay, said the audio came back. 25 big blinds, is that too big for a three bet rejam? Not sure what that means, I'm sorry. All right, um, there's a lot more conversation or uh, questions. I'm gonna skip and move on. Sorry to anyone who I didn't get to. Again, we've got that queen 8 -oh. This is around the bottom, like queen 6-0 -oh is my defend there. 7-3-2 all hearts. And this is the kind of flop that I think players play absolutely terribly. Um, everyone struggles with these one-suit flops, um, both in Hold'em and in Omaha. There's just so much confusion. People are always being fatalists about this. The idea being, I feel like they're always worried their opponent is either has a flush or is going to represent a flush, and it stifles them. Um, and because of that, my exploit here is bluff super wide versus the population. When Oitari checks back that flop, it's not like he has no equity. Um, he can definitely have some reasonable hands. He can have pocket fives with a heart. He can have, he can make some strong check backs occasionally like Kings with a heart. Um, but people never check back a flush there because they shouldn't. It's pretty terrible. You don't need to be balanced. You can always bet your flush. Um, but they're really, really scared with what I would consider weak equity hands. Sometimes they even check back a four or five of spades, which has fantastic benefits as a bet. Um, so I just start hammering people on these boards. This is a population exploit. Um, you don't need to bet big on the turn. You see what happens because sometimes you're just getting easy folds. The opponent just has king nine of spades and they're just, they know that they're good sometimes, but they're just so worried about the river they fold. So I would bet something here on the turn and I would hammer just about every river. With our actual hand, we happen to actually have some equity. So I do want to make a more logic-driven bet in this situation. He bets 390, and I don't like that. This is uh, about two-thirds pot. And after the opponent checks back the flop, we don't need big sizing here because he's already signaled he doesn't have a flush. Um, and a lot of his hands are just, like I said, no equity. He's got eight, nine of spades, and he just checked because he's a wimp. And... We can get this done for 150 very often. Okay, he calls. Smash the river. But the nice thing about if you bet 150 is you still have a lot of rivers you can value bet. I'm still value betting an offsuit eight. I'm definitely value betting a flush, and I'm definitely value betting an offsuit queen, which is all three of them. So when you bet 390 and the river comes in eight of spades, what are you doing now after that guy called the turn? I'm lost. I don't know if I'm value betting. I don't know if I'm checking. Uh, I don't know if I'm bet folding, bet calling. It's it's really difficult. When you make a bluff on the flop or on the turn, you want to be able to continue without drastically reducing your sizing if you hit your cards. So when we bet 390 here on that 10 of hearts river, if we're not over bluffing, what bluffs do we even have at this point? We'd be turning a pair into a bluff doesn't make much sense. I want to make sure I can bet my queen high flush for a reasonable amount if the river is, say, a four of hearts or even more ideal, a king of hearts. So this is kind of what I say outpacing your bluffs when you bet too big and then you get there sometimes and you don't know what to bet or whether to check. Very big problem. Twos on the button. Quick note about twos. If you're not a top end player or not a lot better than your opponent's, you can fold the twos even in the cutoff. Um, people feel very weak folding pairs pre-flop, but twos don't do very well when they don't hit a set. And a lot of the equity that you get from twos comes from advanced play. It's some very directed bluffs that require high level thinking. So I think if you look at um, amateurs and low end pros, you will see that Pocket twos through pocket fives are big money losers for them. They're playing them in some spots where they don't need to be, and it's costing them. Jack, eight, five, two heart flop. And I think this is a really close spot. It's really interesting whether to see bet or check. Whew, give me a moment. I need some water. 
take a look. Some, I'm going to take a look at some questions. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate the compliment. I have folded two pair once or twice on a monotone flop, said Matt. I completely understand. There's a lot of that going on. Um, people are just hyper worried that even if they do have the best hand, they're going to feel so much pressure by the river that they just kind of cave early. Can you provide a full range of your big blind defend range versus three X? If queen six is out of the range is king eight. No queen six is on the border. I I'll make a call with queen six. O. again, what's really important is in this situation, I'm calling it player neutral. I'm saying the big blind is equally good to the button. If you feel outmatched, you can tighten your range a lot. And if you feel a lot better than your opponent and they're not a knit, um, you can widen your range. Um, versus a lot of people that I see in a WPT, I'm just going to call them with like, sometimes 10 two off in the big blind, especially if they like two and a half exit. Um, but to answer the question more thoroughly, um, yeah, like king two off, queen six oh, maybe queen five oh. Um, I would say six five oh, well, four five oh, I'm defending to. Um, every ace, of course, every pair, um, up till nines where I start three betting. Um, just about everything suited except for the worst trash nine two suited, eight two suited, eight three suited, um, fold five two suited, right there. Let's see. Ch -ch 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 -ch. The initial pre-flop razor looked nervous and called me. That's reasonable. Um, how does 8-9 suited have no equity here? That was on the 7-3-2 all hearts. Um, sorry, I should specify I mean suited, not uh, hearts. So spades, clubs, diamonds. Would you ever set mine with pocket twos? Yes. Okay. So I said the ranges are pretty neutral on this flop. And the idea is if we compare this to our ace king eight here, the big blind doesn't have pocket jacks. They shouldn't, but they can totally have pocket eights. They can totally have pocket fives. Um, they have equal numbers of five, eight. I would say both players should only have the two five, eight suiteds remaining. Um, same with Jack five. It should really just be the suited Jack fives and um, Jack eight. They can both have all of the offsuit Jack eight. So there's really nothing big. And that's just the the direct equity from the pairs. There's also seven, nine suiteds, nine tens, hearts, stuff like that. And people are pretty equal on that, the button and big blind. The only thing the button has that's really relevant, that's much stronger, is queens through aces and pocket jacks. Um, but the big blind is working with a few more draws. Like he's got more 760. So I said a C bet folds almost no better hands. Big blind probably folds threes and fours, but that's 12 combinations of hands in something over a thousand combinations of hands that he's working with. Um, it's very low. I said over a thousand. It's probably more like 500. Um, so we're not folding a better hand very often. And then I said, it's not a great board to start barreling. And the idea is we don't really know what we're trying to rep, where we're at. It's the nice thing about this hand is that both of our twos are not going to make a flush. So um, the spade two and spade or club two are freaking awesome in that they're highly deceptive. They look like incredibly neutral cards and they give us a monster and they don't complete the opponent on a big hand. So if we had pocket sixes here, the problem there is especially let's say black sixes, then a six of hearts makes a flush and the um, offsuit six still makes the opponent sometimes when he has 9-7 or potentially a 7-4 suited. Um, twos don't have that problem. Our outs are clean, really clean. So the last point is that we're finding some wins with a check down. Sometimes the opponent doesn't have a better hand and has a decent hand to check down, whether it's because he has no equity, like a king two of spades, or because he thinks he has the winner sometimes. He might have ace 10. So that's why I'd advocate for checking back here. I would say as an exploit against nits who I feel like are going to be really tight by the river, I'll just start barreling. He opts for a small C bet. I'm fine with that size. Um, I think he should have checked back, but it's super close. That was a lot of analysis for what I would consider a very, very close decision. Uh, I'll take a look at questions while it's fresh. Where did that go? 
Hmm. I've screwed it up. Sorry, guys, I might have lost the questions part. New to this. Um, Jonathan, if you can text me or chat, can you maybe tell me how I find questions? I'm losing it. All right, I'm just going to, oh, I found it. We're good. Um, duh, 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 duh. Uh, the next question, Michael followed up with, what is the button range, we assume? Very similar to the big blind, except they have the monsters. Um, I would say four or five suited plus I'm going to open on the button. Um, looking at right around 10, eight off plus, 10, seven's close. Um, nine, eight off is close. Uh, King seven, oh, um, ace two or ace three, oh, um, depends. I can't play pocket twos. Is there a good way to play them? If you can't, fold them. That's good until you get more confident. Do you change the button opening range when shorthanded? Great question. Um, another common mistake, people, I'll get hand history sometimes from top pros that say, maybe not top pros, this one's probably just from like circuit pro level, but it'll say cut off opens, I three bet the button, blah, 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 and the hand will signify, they'll tell me, we were four-handed. Well, if the opponent's good also, this is not relevant. Uh, the only relevance to how many players are in the pot is if you're playing with the old standard ante. Um, then there's four antes versus nine antes. But when you're playing with big blind ante, all that matters is the position. How you play the button versus the cutoff, for instance, remains the same, whether it's four-handed or nine-handed. The only difference is that you're starting in late position when you're playing shorthanded. You're just cutting out the earlier positions. People get a little crazy sometimes, and they have all these weird adjustments to how they play six max versus nine max. But all that's relevant is how much money is in the pot and what your position is. The low jack is the low jack, whether it's under the gun um, because you're five-handed or um, whether it's uh, like after two or three folds if you're nine-handed. I've lost track of where the low jack is. Do you ever limp button? I do, but not deep stack. I do shallow stack. That sounds like another video. There's a lot of complexities to that. Um, and I highly advocate anyone who doesn't feel on the verge of taking that next step to not limp the button. That can be a pretty tragic mistake. Um, I'm really only button limping is pretty high end at this point, except for ICM situations. If not, is there a certain depth where you start to implement them? Yeah. Um, when you implement a button limping range, if there's not ICM, I would say around 30 big blinds is good. But again, you can make so many more mistakes with that than you can with an opening range until you feel very comfortable and well studied on it. I would not advocate it. Um, ICM situations, you can have a button limping range even around 40, 50 big blinds if your opponents cover you. Um, but again, that's a little bit deep. Sorry, I missed the first part of the webinar. Will the session be published on poker coaching? Thank you. Wow, great question. Um, the reason that's a great question is because I just remembered I'm supposed to record this and, oh, sweet. I see something in the bottom right says the session is being recorded. I did not click that, but maybe Jonathan's got that going. Somebody saved me, maybe the software. The answer, Rock, is yes. This will be published on Poker Coaching. I'm not sure where. All right, moving along. And I see we are a little over an hour, so I'm going to make it like two more hands. I've got a bunch of this here, but um, we can do it another time also. All right, he opens 5-3 suited, which is slightly too loose. Um, you heard me say 5-4 suited is what I like for an opening range here. And flops the dream. We're seeing the other end of that. So talking about his C-bet, I said a static flop means small sizing. We have a great hand for large sizing. I mean, we love building this pot here. But large on this flop would be around 50% pot. Um, and that's because it's really static. Um, sometimes the opponent, one of the players is just drawing dead. And that's often the case here. When we have five, three of clubs, if the opponent doesn't have a club, he's essentially drawing dead to a running boat. Um, 
So that means small sizing. So often we're going to have hands like ace, jack of hearts, nine, ten of spades here. Um, we're going to have more confusing hands like fives with or without a club, nines without a club. Um, because of that, we have to be somewhat balanced. We can't be betting as much as we want to be betting here. We would love to pour chips in, but I think 50% is about as big as I want to bet on this flop. We're getting a ton of folds, which in this case, we don't really want. I've got an exploit there. I said, bet 20% against lag opponents who don't respect you. So that would be 20% against Jonathan Jaffe. I just told you that I'm going ham on people on these monotone boards, these one suit flops, because I think players overfold in these situations. They feel confused and they say, when in doubt, make a fold. Why am I going to you know, lose 80 big blinds here? So if you're playing against someone like me, make a tiny bet. Let me go nuts. You can't check back. That's going a little too far. Um, you want to get the pot going. Um, that would be too much of an exploit to make a check back with a hand like this. Um, you want to get that multiplier in place by betting the flop and letting the pot grow literally exponentially. Um, so I would not check here, but go ahead and bet something like 140. Some aggressive opponents might say, you know what? I'll get a fold by the river. Let's go 600 and start, you know, start hammering away with Jack clubs off suit eight. Um, I know I do that a lot. Uh, he bets 380 too big. This is just a sizing mistake. He is too excited with this hand. You got to bet smaller. Um, I like 280 on the big side. And do one more hand. And then I've been asked to do some promotional material. So I know that will be fun for everyone. This is a nothing hand. We're going to skip. Eh, it's not a terribly interesting hand. Skip. Really close on the flop, whether to check back or C-bet. He C-bets. I'm good with that. And I like his check down here. Sorry for the fast forward, but we're running over. Ooh, yeah, okay. This is a good one. We'll make this the finale. King Jack O, really good hand to defend. Playing 92 big blinds here. And we flop some decent equity. Our king high still might be good, but we have a backdoor king high flush draw. We have a gutter to the nuts, and we have two overcards. Again, that might sound like criteria for a check raise, but it's not. Whenever one of the difficult things coming up with check raise bluffs, um, you can see a possibility in a lot of different hands. Um, the trick is finding the best hands to check raise, and I think I'm going to do a, a video at one point or another about check raising out of the big blind because it's a pretty overwhelming concept for a lot of people. And I think there's a lot of mistakes made, both value and bluff. But if you look at what would your value check raise be here? Well, pocket twos. And if you have pocket nines, maybe if you have pocket tens and then 10, nine, and you might have 10, two suited, you might have nine, two suited. You probably shouldn't, but that's not many combinations of hands at all. And when you look at hands like King Jack with a heart, you're going to have a plethora of these. I mean, there's just uh, so many seven eights, queen jacks, king jacks, seven six with a heart, ace two with the ace of hearts. You have so many candidates, but you can have more bluffs. You should have more bluffs than value on the flop, but you can't have so many more. So king jack looks like a better check call to me because we still have the best hand sometimes. So it doesn't accomplish as much as check raising a hand like 7-8 does, where every fold that 7-8 gets on the flop is beneficial. Where King Jack, the opponent still has 7-6, seven, 7-8. Seven, sometimes the opponent has um, King 5 of diamonds. Um, this hand is a better check call. Turn looks nice, offsuit Jack. Again, not a lead. Um, we don't really grab much of an advantage on that turn. And our hand in particular definitely doesn't want to lead. It's one of these middle hands. It's neither a monster nor a hand that wants to bluff. We face that 70% pot bet again. So what we want to do first, and this is what you want to do at every stage of poker. If there's one thing you can do to get better at poker, um, and I'll tell you, it's going to start off as work. It's going to feel like work for a long time, but range your opponent at every street. If you watch poker for fun, you like watching uh, the high rollers, the WPTs, anything, cover the cards up somehow and do the ranging yourself. 
when you see the opponent's hand, it, no matter how unbiased you want to be, the human mind just can't filter that out. You are going to be at the mercy of the knowledge you've already absorbed. So I'm a big advocate of whenever you're watching poker, whether it's online and a hand that you're not playing in or on TV, range, range, range. That's how you get better at poker. The best players in the world are the best rangers in the world. They can sit here and they come up with all of Oitari's logical bluffs, all of his logical um, value bets. And then the really advanced players say they look at the external factors that might lead Oitari to make exploits in this situation. And they start coming up with their best weighted guesstimates of all that. Um, my brain is not a, you know, calculator or some, you know, special computer. I'm not, you know, whizzing through percentages um, when I'm thinking about this. It's just second nature in the way that you learn your times tables in grade school and you can just rattle off eight times eight, 64. Whoa, super impressive. In this situation, I'm going to go through and I'm going to, you know, rapid fire list a lot of bluffs in value. I'll miss some of them. No doubt. It'll take me a little bit, but that is from experience of working through this. That's what Jonathan Little can do. That's what high end pros do is they think about these situations and they see them from both perspectives, not what they hope the opponent has, not what they're scared the opponent has, but that whole collection of hands. All right. That was my ranging rant, but it cannot be understated. So the opponent's value I said is mostly two pair sets, straights, a rare overpair and uh, a rare Jack X. The reason Jack X is rare is because his Jacks that bet reasonably big on the flop, which he did, uh, he bet 60%, um, maybe 55%, would be like Jack 8 and Jack Queen and King Jack. And honestly, I would check a lot of those on this turn. Um, that's a longer discussion, but he doesn't really have ace jack hammering that flop too often, and he doesn't have much in the way of lower jacks that open the button. So that's not super common, combined with the fact that we have a jack in our hand too. Two pairs, it's mostly 9-10. Um, if he did have jack 10, that might bet the flop what it did, and it would continue like this on the turn. I wouldn't say jack 9's in there. Pocket 2's, pocket 9's, pocket 10's, this makes sense with all of them. I would actually bet a little larger. King-queen totally makes sense. 7-8 totally makes sense. Queen eight suited makes sense. Um, and then his bluffs. They're mostly hearts, possible king X of diamonds, queen X of diamonds, possible ace of hearts, offsuit eight, ace of hearts, offsuit queen. You see, that's a pretty narrow range. Um, I'm not talking about, oh, he can have queen X. Oh, he can have uh, king X. You have to go back to the flop. Ranging means using all of the information available to you. And there was a lot of information in that C bet on the flop. A good player is not just betting 300 into 567 on this flop um, with king five of spades. That's not happening very often. So I'm kind of taking that out. Um, so I want hands that make sense both on the pre-flop. He has to have them in his range. Flop, they have to be congruent with that 300 bet. And on the turn, this 70% pot needs to continue to make sense. And this is where I'm going to range a good player a lot more accurately than I'm going to range someone who's new to the game or someone who's scared or confused. Um, they're going to have some bets that don't make so much sense to me. So in those situations, my ranging has to be a little bit less exact and open to some more hands um, that I know the population bets here a lot, like Jack-8, that a lot of really good players find a check. Um, moral of the story, easy check call. Um, we are not strong enough to check raise for value. We don't really need to protect that much. We actually protect the straight a little bit with the king. Um, there's no sense in a check raise. You can get really, really lost. That would be a monstrous mistake to check raise the turn with this hand. And the river, a check. We don't like it at all. We're pretty scared, but that doesn't turn our hand into a bluff. This is not, um, one of those situations the river wouldn't have improved us to a value hand that wants to bet nearly enough. And we're facing 1760. So this is two thirds pot right around there. So now let's range our opponent again. River ranging is the easiest thing because now you've acquired the most information. You are flooded with data from the flop turn and now the river decision. So at this point, his value is really clear. He can have two pairs, sets, some straights. He no longer has queens or kings or jack x. 
This bet does not make sense with Jack eight of diamonds. This bet does not make sense with pocket queens. If you wanted to turn queens into a bluff, um, he would smash this a lot bigger. This is pretty senseless. Um, he's not folding better hands with it, and he's not getting almost any calls from worse hands. His bluffs are mostly hearts, but we have to come up with which hearts. Pas ilbe, that's a nice typo, king x of diamonds or queen x of diamonds. And then I've got that ace of hearts offsuit eight, ace of hearts offsuit queen. But those aren't bluffs now. And all of the hands that include the ace of hearts, they now beat us. Um, whether it was ace x of hearts, like ace four of hearts, or that ace of hearts offsuit queen. This river sucks for us. One, he made the best hand um, a chunk of the time. And two, we cannot come up with enough bluffs to make this call. We have a decent hand, but this is not... A lot of people, they look at this spot and they say, hey, you know what? I've got a king. That blocks king-queen. That's enough to call. That's, that's nice. That's true. You do block king-queen, but you bring it down from 16 combinations to 12. Big whoop. It's not huge. What you really want to look at is what bluffs are still left. And if you look at that list, it's really low. When I say mostly hearts, come up with some hearts that bluff the turn, want to bluff this river, didn't make a better hand. You're looking at like seven, six of hearts, seven, five of hearts, um, queen, seven of hearts. Can't be king X of hearts. We have the king of hearts. Can't be ace X of hearts. That made a value hand on the river. We're really struggling. This looks like a close decision. It's not. This is a really easy fold, and I think a lot of people make this call, including Brisket's house here. Makes the call. Faces queen 8 which is a borderline open. I don't know if I would expect him to have queen 8 or not. It's right on the border, queen 8, queen 9. Um, I think it's fine. Um, backing up real quick, we're not really analyzing Oitari, but I hate this river bet. This is so small. It worked out in this situation. You have a monster. Your top end value when you're not going to get check raised needs to be your top end bet. This is a great over bet. I'm betting 4K all day, um, maybe more. You got to bet bigger here. You're going to have some bluffs that want to smash. Um, queen eight and king queen need to be over bets on this river. All righty. Um, look at questions one more time. Let's see. Why have we not seen a single three bet from the big blind in this webinar? Great question, Jim. Uh, the reason is we haven't really come across a good hand to three bet. Um, the bluff candidates I like haven't really come up, and none of the value hands have come up in the big blind for a three bet. Button versus big blind, um, you're not going to have a three bet very, very often. Um, you're going to be, like I said, three betting like nines plus and ace king, ace queen. Um, and then your bluffs, that's probably part of another video because there's different bluff ranges you can construct, but I do like using ace two through ace four off. Those are good um, potential bluffs, um, some low suited kings. We'll get into that another time, um, but you're just not going to see too many three bets. Um, we only went over maybe 12 hands, something like that. Um, why would we lead? Would you lead that nine, 10, two flop? No. Um, ranges are pretty neutral on that 10, nine, two. Um, that would be right here. but that's not strong enough for us to lead, um, except exploitatively. We're going to check there. Um, one of the things when you think about leading is that so often you're, you're signaling so much information because by leading, you're not saying you have a made hand. You're not saying you have a draw, but you're saying you have one of the two because you can't just lead crap on that 10, nine, two. You're not just going to lead queen five of spades. That's really exploitatively aggressive. Um, so instantly when you lead, you cut out like the bottom 40% of your crap. You're telling the opponent, I don't have a seven off. And when you give away free information, you want to be getting high return on that. You want really good benefits and the benefits of leading are not enough to warrant that. Um, that comes up in a lot of spots. Ranging is the thing I forget to do in the moment when playing online. And is very obvious when I look at my hand histories later, then I feel like an idiot. Totally understand Eric. Um, that's what happens to all of us. We we make that bad river call and we're like, oh shit, this was really obvious if I thought about it. The hands that I was thinking he could have, if I gave him 30 seconds of thought, he couldn't have those. What he did on the flop told us that he doesn't have those. And that's the difficulty. And when you're talking about online in particular, you have a limited amount of time. That's where 
being good at ranging comes in even more. If you're playing eight tables online, for instance, wow, your ability to range better be spot on because it's going to be very abbreviated. You're going really quickly. And if you're live, you don't want to sit there for five minutes on every street and be, you know, the dickhead at the table who's just holding everybody up. Um, you want to go, you know, the more you practice, the more second nature it is, the quicker you are with it, the more accurate you are, the more comfortable you are with your decisions in hindsight. Um, sorry, Christina, it's a long question for me to go over. I'm going to try and go. Also, you block King X of hearts, which is bad. Yep. You're right on there with Eric. Um, you mentioned how you like a 4K overbet by Oitari, but wouldn't that price out Brisket House for a call? Yeah, uh, I think Brisket House ought to fold his King Jack versus that 4K. Um, again, I think he should have folded versus 1670. I think that was pretty clear, but um, for him, it should be. But um, that's not, if we're Oitari, we don't know that Brisket's House has King Jack. He can have some hands that cannot make the fold there. Um, for instance, if I'm, Brisket house, I would call with ace queen. I would call with any of my two pair ace if he had any kind of set that happened to have check called twice. I mean, he shouldn't, but those need to call. Um, and if he has a hand like queen jack or king, yeah, even the king jack's going to be kind of close for 4K because now the opponent's repping a lot of king queen. But I would say any hand that has a queen, I would struggle to fold to 4K. Everything's going to be a hero call versus that bet. But if you feel that 4K is like never getting called, well, then. Use it for all your bluffs. The fact is it actually will get called sometimes. You need to be thoughtful about which hands for the bluff, which hands for the value. It's very tricky. Um, I have an overbet for value video that's out right now, and there's one for bluff that I don't know if it's released yet or maybe in a day or two. It's on Poker Coaching Premium. I really like it. I put a lot of work into it. Um, curious what you guys think. All right. I teamed up with Jonathan Little, bring exclusive high-level content, Poker Coaching Premium. Yes, every month I'm going to add something. Um, I'm excited about it. Uh, I love coaching. I do individual coaching primarily. Jonathan pitched me on his site. The premium end really appealed to me. I want to bring the high-level content. Um, you guys will be the judge whether it's good. Um, this is about co Poker Coaching Premium. You get 600 interactive hand quizzes um, that are on there already and more stuff's always coming. 150 extra video classes, 40 challenge webinars, 25 courses, yada, yada. You get the point. Um, I'll say about those hand quizzes, I think that's a really good idea that I'd like to do some of. Um, some of my students, um, I send them my own versions of quizzes, but they're not visual. It's not a um, video. I looked at some of these quizzes that Jonathan and some of the other coaches have up. Really good idea, I think, to reinforce what you learn. Actually test yourself. It's really difficult when you're working on poker to – it's very easy to feel as if you – know a lot more than you do when you're hearing the answers, the correct answers given. So it's nice to test yourself and see what you actually retained. New coaching content every month. Yep, 15 new hand quizzes, two live coaching webinars, live challenge webinar, two video classes. Uh, I think <clears throat> the other guy doing a lot of the webinars is Matt Affleck, and I checked out his content. It looks great, um, very good for both lower end, medium players, and some stuff there for high end players to get a lot better too. He's working a lot with solvers. Available right now for me, intro into overbetting, when to overbet for value, when to overbet as a bluff, how to exploit your opponents with overbets, in-depth hand examples and analysis. Yeah, so that's about my overbet video. I really hope you guys check it out. Um, I put a lot of work into it, trying to explain overbetting, which I think is a concept that some people might theoretically understand on the surface, but they have a lot of trouble implementing into their game and they know it's necessary or they suspect it is. Check that video out. Um, let me know your thoughts. Coming soon from Jonathan Jaffe. Turning pre-flop observations into post-flop adjustments. Yeah, so I made a video where we look at some stuff that people do pre-flop and I'm basically giving you my thoughts, dissecting what I see when I open I watch a good pro open king five suited under the gun. And I tell you all the things it means to me. I don't just say, oh, this guy's a lag player. Okay, um, he'll be a little bit looser. Let's adjust like he's loose. There's really specific things I think about. Acquiring information at the table is really, really important. And that's where there's a big separation gap between players who just 
learn material. They just watch some training videos. They say, okay, yeah, the, the pro's doing this, the pro's doing that, but they're not working with the same set of variables that the top end pros are. Um, I'm changing my ranging of my opponents all the time based on little, little things I catch. Something about an opponent's preflop tendency, um, like a light flat preflop, will influence me about their turn range on a wet board. Um, You'll get a lot more about that if you watch that video. It's going to be coming out soon, I think, in about a week. Um, exclusive content every month for Coach Poker Coaching Premium. Yeah, I'm going to come out with stuff every month, um, do some of these webinars, um, and I'm going to make some videos. Poker Coaching Premium. Yep, you guys already got this. This was all the stuff that's already there, all the stuff coming from me every month. Um, there's not 15 new hand quizzes coming from me. Um, can't say that, but 15 new hand quizzes coming from the poker coaching premium coaches in general. Yep, that's it. All right. Thank you guys. I'll take one more quick peek at the questions, see if there's anything in general. Thanks, thanks. Thank you guys. Appreciate the nice comments. Um, all right. Yeah. Jim says, not at all comfortable with overbets. Look forward to it. Great. Um, thank. That covers it. When's your next live tournament? There is stuff at the uh, Hard Rock around Thanksgiving. Um, I'm going to duck out for Thanksgiving, visit family, and then come back and play. There's like a 3,500, maybe a 25K. Um, and then aside from that, I mostly play live cash here in Florida um, in the winter. All right. Thank you, everyone. Much appreciated the questions. Thanks for making this easy on me. Uh, definitely enjoyed this live format more than... I expected. I'm more used to uh, kind of sitting in my garage and slowly piecing together videos, but this was fun kind of doing it on the fly. See ya.